Hi, it's Mr. Anderson. Today I'm going to go over the big idea of homeostasis. Uh, I'm going to be using Prezi to do this, so if you want to follow along, you could go to this address. It's bit.ly slash homeoprezi, and if you type that in, it should you bring, bring you to the homeostasis uh, Prezi that I created. Prezi is a, it's kind of like PowerPoint. It's a flash way to look at uh, material online. And so uh, what I would always start with is if you go over here under more and click on full screen, you're going to see exactly what's on the screen um, right now. And so this is a concept map of the unit four, which is on homeostasis. So basically this uh, covers the big parts of homeostasis. Um, a few big features before we get into the details. Um, there's this cycle over here where life is constantly uh, interacting with the environment, uh, both abiotic and biotic factors, and through feedback mechanisms and response, it's able to maintain this homeostasis. And so what is this whole unit about? It's about homeostasis and how we maintain that. And this regular cycle is going to be right over on this side. Uh, if we go over here, that response can either be behavioral, what we do, or physiological. And some examples of physiological I'll talk about are development and defense. And then behavioral is going to be mechanisms of timing and control. But remember, like everything in biology, evolution is is driving this, or evolution is that con that concept um, that sits at the root of all of biology. So let me clear the screen. So if you just, I'm going to just kind of arrow through this. So this is on homeostasis. So homeostasis is how we maintain a internal uh, stable environment. And so especially as we left the ocean, as we left water behind, we had to start maintaining a lot of that homeostasis. What do you call somebody who can't maintain homeostasis? Well, you would call them somebody who's dead. Uh, in other words, if we can't maintain this stable internal environment, we don't last long. And so what we're doing is we're surrounding by our environment and we're constantly um, responding to changes in the environment. The two major factors, the only factors that we respond to are uh, called abiotic and biotic. Abiotic means without life. And so these are going to be non-living factors and biotic factors are going to be living factors. So what's an example of an abiotic factor that I have to respond to? A, a big one that jumps out right away would be temperature. What about a biotic factor that I have to respond to? Maybe the invasion of a virus would be a biotic factor or competing with other living organisms. And so um, this is the podcast. It's called Biotic and Abiotic Factors. And so if you're confused on what I just said, you may want to check that out. Our environment tends to stay uh, relatively stable, but there are disruptions in our environment. And so I talk about uh, disruptions in our in, in environmental uh, or our environment in this podcast. Um, a couple of things I talk about are like hurricanes and how that impacted life or invasive species and how that it can impact life. And so if you have major disruptions to the environment, that makes it hard for life to continue existing. But in general, we use feedback loops to respond to our environment. And those feedback loops are two ways. Uh, remember, we have negative feedback loops negative feedback loops are going to keep our values near a set point. And so you have a set point and if it goes too high then we have a one word response and then if it goes too low then we have a separate response. And so a quick example of that if we're talking about temperature that abiotic factor what happens if our temperature goes too high well then we're going to start to sweat um, we're going to dilate blood and then our temperature is going to lower. But if our temperature goes too low, then we're going to start to shiver, constrict, constrict uh, blood vessels. If we talk about positive feedback loops, positive feedback loops are going to move us away from a set point. So the quintessential example I talk about uh, is uh, childbirth. So when, it, when the head of the child starts to push on the cervix, that produces uh, contractions which produces more oxytocin, which produces more contractions, which puts more pressure on the cervix. And so that's a positive feedback loop when we're moving away from a set point. Or in this podcast on feedback loops, I talk about ethylene and how fruit ripening can transfer from fruit to fruit. Uh, and so that can speed up reactions. So feedback then, uh, remember, results in a response. So that's a response from the organism itself. And I talk, to, talk about uh, response to external environments in this uh, podcast. Here it is a little water bear and water bears are really good at responding to changes in their environment and surviving. Um, those responses can be either behavioral or physiological and so that's wor worth defining what those are. Physiological is going to be, well let's start with behavioral. 
Behavioral response is going to be something that an organism does. So it's a response of an entire organism. Physiological, generally, we're talking about its response of parts of an organism. And so what would be a behavioral response to an increase in temperature? Well, if I'm too hot, I might take off a coat or I might sit in the shade. So that'd be behavioral response. What about a physiological response? That might be sweating or dilating of blood vessels. And so those are the major types of responses. I talk a lot about behavioral responses in the podcast on timing and control or mechanisms of timing and control. Right here I'm talking about jet lag and how we use circadian rhythms. So that's a whole organism. Also talk about plants and how they grow towards uh, or away from light. When we're talking about physiological uh, responses, the two big things I talk about are development and how developmental changes in organisms have created organisms that are adapted to their environment and can respond to changes. And then physiological, I also talk about plant and animal defenses. And so animals and ha plants and how they defend themselves. In the animal defense, I really get into some detail on um, acquired immunity. And so using lymphocytes, using red blood, or excuse me, white blood cells, B cells, T cells, and that's a little bit intense, and so you may want to take another look at that. And so those are my responses, both behavioral and physiological. To any environmental stimuli, I'm probably going to have both behavioral and physiological stimuli uh, or responses. But remember, like everything in biology, evolution shapes both the behavioral responses and physiological. And so in this podcast, I'm on... Uh, natural selection and behavior, I talk about how plants uh, evolve that photoperiod or response to the amount of light, or this is a picture of a bower bird, and how a male bower bird can produce this wonderful bower for the female, but it's been developed through natural selection. And then also how evolution shapes physiological responses, so those are responses within the body. And so the two major ones I talk about in this podcast are going to be um, showing how our excretory system has remained the same through organisms over time, basically moving circulatory system in through some kind of a tube where we create filtrate. But also the evolution, when you have changes, that's reflected in physiological adaptations as well. And so as we moved from water onto land and we had to move from gills to lungs being that structure, we can see that in the uh, evolutionary record or in the record of life on our planet. And so that's homeostasis. It, it, talks, it touches on numerous chapters within our book. But that central theme is how we can maintain an internal stable environment in the face of a changing environment. And so I hope that's helpful.